Uh, <laughs> and this is Dave. He's the video I'm guy. The video guy. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk to you about whiteboard video, mobile, and why people dig a good story. And just to frame this and to put it in context, there's an old saying that any activity, if properly examined, is a mirror, a window into the human experience. Now, I don't pretend that we're going to give you a window into the human experience, but I think we can get into some insights that I hope are refreshing for you. So let's start with what you already know, which is that you need to know your audience. Because if you don't know who you're talking to, well, we all know how that ends. What we'd like to posit to you is a little bit further that you need to know how your market is experiencing media. And it's changing. There's a historical context here because early film, for example, they would literally set up a tripod, right, and film a stage play because that's what they knew. That was the context they had. And it took a while for the tropes and the techniques that we understand as filmic to evolve. Then we get to TV. What did they do? They reproduced film. They would do these big, broad, wide shots, those really early black and white westerns. They didn't understand that TV was a different expression, a different format. Then we get to desktop video. What did early desktop video do? It reproduced TV. And again, it took a little bit of a Kickstarter time before the new tropes, the new realities evolved. And what we're talking about today is mobile video. How's that different? And I think a key thing to understand here is the different viewer experience. And a key moment for me in sort of my education as a media producer came at 3 o'clock in the morning at an editing suite not far from here downtown working on an hour-long documentary program for the Discovery Channel. And it was 3 in the morning, and I was working with a producer who had come in from LA, and I was getting really frustrated with him because he kept telling me that I wasn't resetting the characters and the stakes in the show enough. He said, you have to, we have to reintroduce this character. We have to reintroduce their stakes. What are they trying to achieve? What are their obstacles? What are the stakes if they achieve them or if they fail? And frustrated late at night, I turned to him and I said, can't we give the audience a little bit more credit? Can't we give them some credit that they can follow a narrative thread for 10 minutes? Everyone who watches television is not dumb. <laughs> and he took a deep breath, and he was a much more older and experienced guy than me. And he said, you're right, you do need to show the audience respect, but you have it wrong about what to respect. And what you really need to respect is the fact that these people are watching this show and it is not necessarily their number one priority. For you it is right now. This show is our life, we're 100% focused on it. People watching this show might be doing something else. They might be playing with their kids. They might be having a side conversation with their spouse. They might be eating dinner. And every time they put their head down, to cut their steak or get a bite of applesauce or whatever it is, and they look away from the TV screen for 10 seconds, when they look back up, they can't be lost with what's going on. And they need to be able to re-engage in the story within 15 to 20 seconds, or they will flip the channel and we will lose them. And that lesson is very important in respecting the experience of your audience, not just knowing who they are. And it's exponentially more important with mobile. Because the beautiful thing about mobile is everybody has a screen on them almost all the time. So you have this unlimited access to people, which is fantastic. The problem is you have absolutely zero control over the context and the experience of how they're viewing your video content. And you need to account for that when you create the content. So there are some new things to consider in how you create content. Uh, new cinematography. Lawrence of Arabia does not look good on a mobile device. <laughs> it's a close-up medium. <laughs> um, you don't want really complex images. You don't want really detailed images. Text is terrible. Um, new techniques. One of the biggest things that has evolved for mobile video is direct address to camera. That's something that is not done traditionally in television or other traditional uh, media outlets. You know, usually if you're interviewing someone, you're talking to an interviewer off camera, it's your typical nightly news sort of thing. That has completely changed. Now direct address is very popular and it's for a specific reason. Again, that person has so many distractions when they're watching something on their mobile device. They might have emails popping up, they might have push notifications popping up. All the different things that we have on our phones. And actually, here comes a quick question. Who's gotten an email or a tweet or a notification while we've been talking? Raise your hand. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. You go. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're trying to have someone watch your video, all of that stuff is interrupting them. 
So direct address, while for a long time it was a no-no, uh, is actually become very popular on mobile because you are literally making eye contact with someone which holds their attention much stronger than not having direct eye contact with them. Um, another thing is the primacy of the genuine, and that is that along the same lines of the direct address, um, online video and especially mobile video has really been shaped by user-generated content. And user-generated content has an authenticity to it. If you want to review a product, the most popular things that are online are consumer user-generated reviews of those products. They're not put out by the brand, they're not put out by a magazine. People want to know what real people like them think of it. And there is a trust there that is really, really difficult to replicate. Um, and that sort of pervades everything with mobile video. Um, obviously, you have an explosion of platforms you can watch on any device in the world. So it's out there, that's the great thing. The ability to control the context is the difficult thing. Radically reduced cost of entry. There is definitely still a time and a place for a big budget video production. There's still a time and a place for a TV spot that costs in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But for mobile video, you don't necessarily have to do that anymore, and it's not just to save money on your budget. It might not be the most effective way to convey your message. And again, that all relates back to this authenticity of the user-generated experience. And that sometimes something that looks really slick and really professional, people read as a commercial and they tune it out in this, in this world of, of watching mobile videos. And so sometimes you need to consider for the target audience we're going for and for the way they're going to be the experiencing this, what is the best way to craft your message? What's the best genre and what's the best style of video to get the best reaction and the most attention from your viewers. And this leads to uh, the primacy of video in messaging, which is not news, I think, to anyone in this room. Uh, recent Axon research showed that, with one of their studies, that seven in 10 people view brands in a more positive light after watching an interesting video about them. Now, of course, this leaves open the question of, what qualifies as interesting, but we'll talk about that. Cisco, just talking about volume, by 2017, video will account for 69% of all consumer internet traffic. So, as we all know, it's big, it's getting bigger, it's not going away. Let's get to the actual case study at this point. We were approached by a new division, newish division within Discover, and Discover, as, as I'm sure you all know, very highly respected, very well-known, very trusted credit card uh, company. They have this newish division, alternately called Discover Financial Services and Discover Bank, and they want to get the idea out that they are a full-service banking institution and get this word out to the world. Part of how they want to position themselves on this is as educators, and this goes back to the whole concept of experiential marketing, of attraction versus projection, marketing, the idea that I am providing you with something of value, I'm providing you with something you're not getting from someone else and therefore you want to come and experience my brand. Their idea with this is financial education. And the primary vehicle we all agreed upon from the very start was going to be whiteboard videos. Now, trying to do a financial education program is a more complicated ask than you are thinking. For example, money is a sensitive subject. So for, as just an exercise, turn to the person on your right, tell them your net worth and all of your debts. Go, go. <laughs> go ahead. Nobody? Nobody. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, see, people are very private about this stuff. It's touchy, <laughs> okay? So you wade into this and you say, we're going to talk to you about money. That's eh, not the simplest thing in the world. And then there's the whole math angle, right? A large number of people are very sensitive about math. Recent study by Ogilvy PR showed that 36% of adult Americans say they cannot do math. Now, do we think that means they can't do 4 plus 4 equals 8? No. But they do have some kind of mental thing where they're telling themselves, I can't do math. 30% of those surveyed said they would rather clean their bathroom than solve a simple math equation. So put these two together and you start to understand this ask. They're saying, let's become financial educators. And we're thinking, oh yes, money and math, great. <laughs> That's not sensitive at all. <laughs> so, but our mission is very clear from Discover. 
we are to cover financial literacy subjects. We are to position them, with their assistance and their instruction, as financial educators. And in depth, it's not going to be superficial. They make that very clear from the start. You're going to give people some real, tangible lessons in financial literacy. So this raises the obvious question, why did we all agree from the word go? Why did we all go, oh yeah, whiteboard video, why was that obvious? Ah, and I think Dave can tell us a little bit about the state of play with financial video. Well, and this is just, this is a truthful from last week. If you Google financial literacy in, well, if you search financial literacy in YouTube, these are among the top 10 videos that will come up. So first you have the talking head lecture with very likely fake students from stock video. <laughs> She's not there. <laughs> Neither is she. <laughs> Neither is he. Uh, next, we have the one we're all familiar with, the, uh, the Guru Get Rich Quick seminar. Within less than five years, Jamie had rebuilt his life using the strategies he had discovered. With a lot of stock photos <laughs> and the air punch. <laughs> Uh, we have the talking head repackaged with the teleporting host. So they tried to jazz this one up by having this guy bounce around the lawn. Well, he's on the left. He's, he's on the left. <laughs> and he's back into the middle. And now we're going to video from the 1980s. <laughs> this is the rich dad, poor dad guy. So pretty well known, but pretty old video. Uh, we have an educational narrative with some unfortunate music choices and I think a rather disturbing voiceover tone. She's a typical teenager. Yeah. I don't think he likes her. Also kind of reads like a don't go on Craigslist ad. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and then you have a little bit more modern one, but 2D clip art. Uh, but this basically devolves into PowerPoint, which again, on mobile video, a lot of text really doesn't work very well. So those are just some examples of things that are still out there today that we didn't think were particularly successful. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and in that last one you saw, there was. Um, a lot of text on the screen all at once, uh, which is bad enough in a PowerPoint and is exponentially worse on a phone. So the whiteboard question, how many of you have heard of Richard Wiseman, the psychi psychologist? No? He's a uh, professor of psychology at the University of Hertford, uh, Hertfordshire, UK. Uh, he's been declared by Scientific American to be the most interesting man working in psychology right now. So he's a contemporary of ours. Um, he did an experiment in 2012 that was fascinating. He recorded the same lecture twice. He did one as a direct address, a talking head on a camera. And in the second one, he did a dirt simple, no budget, whiteboard video. And he would show them to test audiences and then quiz them, test them, their comprehension, their retention. And there was a stark difference in the results. Now, you're probably guessing already because of the whole topic that whiteboard video did better. I don't have to tell you that. Do you want to take a stab at how much better? Like we all, if, if you've had any involvement in education media at all, you know that to get a 5%, a 6% a bump is brutal in results. 80? <laughs> not 80, no, not 80%. <laughs> that would be miracle working. No, there was a measurable across the board 15% bump in comprehension and retention just by adding the element of animation. Here's Dr. Wiseman's statement on it. I won't try to do a British accent for you. Anyone involved in education or research knows that this is massive. Normally you have to work hard to get five, maybe 10% increase in any kind of behavioral measure like that. Just by animation, you're seeing a 15% increase. So this is a very, oh, I'm, I'm blocking you, sorry. <laughs> Just by adding animation, you're getting a really big measurable bump in comprehension. So again, complicated topic, difficult topic, 
natural choice. Now we're going to back up and walk you through the actual production process, which you may be familiar with or not. We begin everything, a project like this, any project, with a creative brief, which as you all know is the research, the competitive research, the mission research, statements you've got from the client, putting it all together so that you know what you're doing. And then we have a sort of words and images track and a production track. And for the words and images track, we start with a treatment, general description of the video, description of the project, given to the client so we can all go, this is what we're talking about, this is what we're talking about. This is how we want to do it, this is how we want to do it. We go to a mood board where we start showing them the kinds of images and the kind of mood we're going to try to depict with the video. We move on to a script where we're actually trying to nail down the verbiage, nail down the verbal part of the messaging. And then we move on to a storyboard. And we're really trying to lock things down at this point because changes, developments, things done in this stage, it can be very flexible, you know. And we don't want to be making big changes when we get to production. <laughs> yes, and again, obviously, once you go into production, things start to cost a lot more money. So you definitely want to make sure you have things worked out before then. I'll just move very quickly through this. The point I want to make here, especially for whiteboard video, is about voiceover and specifically about voiceover casting. Um, everyone gets very uh, focused on the visuals and the artwork and all of that. The voice of your video is incredibly important. And it really is the voice of your brand. And it's something that people hear in the first couple seconds of the video and they make an incredible number of assumptions and first impressions based on that voice. So that's a very important thing to consider. For Discover, it was very important that we cast someone who was young, that we cast someone who was friendly, and that they were warm. Because again, what we were dealing with here are pretty complex financial topics that the audience we're trying to reach is potentially intimidated by. So we want to combine the entire style of the video to be invitational, to be approachable, and to be not intimidating. So people can explore these topics in a way that gives them a little bit of a base understanding and invites them to then be empowered to learn more and not to be intimidated by it. So that voiceover casting aspect is, is extremely important. My turf. <laughs> uh, this is where some sad, poor writer sits down and decides what's actually going to happen here and envisions the whole thing, comes up with the words, maybe lays out some visual ideas, which the designers can then cheerfully ignore. Um, this is where it all begins. Uh, so if the project is late, you can always blame the writer. I strongly recommend that. Uh, and we move on from here, and this is also a great stage where you can send this to the client. The client can look at it and say, is this the right voice? Are the right words being used? Is this the right tonality? What are these visuals you're imagining? And then you move on to the storyboards. But before, before we get to storyboards, actually, can okay. we go back one? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing I'd like to say about script. In traditional production, the script is the Bible. Everything's locked in at script. That is not the case for animation. Um, and I think it's a really important point, despite what writers may say. <laughs> um, it is about the words, but more importantly, it is about the ideas that you're conveying in your message and which ideas you're going to convey through words and which ideas you're going to convey through images. And that is what's really the most important thing at this scripting phase, which is why we have this sort of two-column script set up. Because it's really important to figure out early on, if you're doing a whiteboard, how much can you communicate with your imagery? Because your imagery is going to work much better than talking at your audience. So you want to keep the words very conversational and very friendly and try to explain some of the more complex meaty stuff through your imagery. So it's really important at the scripting phase to understand that that division is sort of the key aspect here, is creating that two column script, not just worrying about the words. And then if we can flip on to storyboards, this then is the real Bible <laughs> of animation, is the storyboards. And just to talk through a couple things here, Everything that you need to know before you go into production is in here, and there's, it's on a lot of levels. You have broken down what's highlighted in yellow is what the voiceover is going to be. Beneath that is a verbal description or a written description of the actions that are going to occur on screen. You can see the final artwork and the style of the artwork. Uh, so you need to make sure that the artwork is matching your message. Are you know do these? 
you'll see in the, the video in a couple minutes, but do these images on the bottom row, is this accurately conveying how you pay off a mortgage? Is that reading for people? Are they understanding that, that the equity in your home goes up and that's represented by one color and what you have left to pay off is represented by another color? Um, you're dealing with things with whiteboard, like how often do you want the hand on screen? Traditional whiteboard is literally just a recording of someone drawing. The problem with that is you can never get that hand out of there. So there's different ways to do it. The way we did these is actually tracing the original artwork in post. So that hand drawing can be in there whenever we want it to. It can be gone whenever we want it to. And that was a big thing for this particular topic because it is pretty complex. And we needed to keep it really simple and really clear. So we don't want the hand going around all over the place distracting everybody. So we use it in strategic places. In certain areas, you'll see it moves the animation rather than drawing it. There's all kinds of variations you can do by not doing a traditional just recording of an artist drawing on screen. And so now we can show you. So why would you want a home equity loan? And what exactly is it? The why part is easy. When you are thinking about a major expense, such as remodeling your kitchen, or looking to consolidate your bills, a home equity loan could help you achieve these goals. But what's this equity business? What's that about? Let's say you bought your home for $250,000, taking out a $200,000 mortgage, and you've made your payments and knock that debt down by half. Your home may have also changed in value. So take the current value of your home, subtract the money you still owe on the mortgage, and you get your home equity. A home equity loan enables you to borrow against that value. Because the loan is linked to your house, also called secured, it is safer for banks and they offer lower interest rates and higher borrowing amounts than unsecured loans. And the interest you pay may be tax deductible. There are two types of home equity products. The first type is a home equity line of credit, which functions more like a credit card with an approved borrowing limit, which you can access as you need over time, and a variable interest rate, which can move up and down. Since your monthly payment is determined by how much you've borrowed and your current interest rate, your payments will vary as you change the amount you borrow or as interest rates change. The second type is a home equity loan. This usually offers a fixed amount for a fixed time with a fixed rate of interest and predictable regular monthly payments. Now that you know how a home equity loan works, you can start planning that kitchen renovation you've been thinking about. Learn more at Discover Home Equity Loans. That was the final result. Two things to note about that particular project is that one of the things we were told by the stakeholders within Discover was that a key deliverable for them was getting consumers to a place where they would know the difference between a home equity line of credit and a home equity loan. So that was not optional. You know, in the, in the urge to simplify, we ask, can we take that out? They're like, no, no. <laughs> so the uh, other thing? We also had to make it through legal. Oh, legal, sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That was that was a process. <laughs> we work with a fair number of regulated industries, and we're used to it, but it always hurts <laughs> going through legal. So let's, with that out of the way, and also uh, that video, you're some of the very first people uh, outside of Brella and Discover who've seen it. This campaign does not launch until November and December. It's going to have a heavy social presence. I think it's going to be almost entirely driven by social. Uh, so, you're the first. Cheers. <laughs> but you saw how, despite the complexity of the topic, I mean, we tried to keep it visually simple. We're anticipating people on little four-inch iPhones looking at this. So, we're trying, man. We're trying. <laughs> Let's back up and, and look at what we know about video and how it applies here. Four complex ideas both from Weissman's work and from our own experience, we can say animation is a really, really powerful tool if you're going to go with and try to get across a complex or difficult idea. Simplicity and execution is absolutely important for, for executing on mobile. And as Orbitz just reminded us, simple sounds easy, and it isn't. Simple is hard. 
Uh, if you want to go longer than what that was, that was about a minute 30 explainer video. If you want to go longer than that, you do have to think about narrative. You do have to think about story. Um, I have seen well-intentioned people saying, oh, we'll do a 10-minute talking head video, and you're going, no, 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 you're not. Um, no one's going to watch it. <laughs> if you want to go, I would say as a rule of thumb, if you want to go over two minutes, you have to consider putting in some kind of narrative structure. And that doesn't mean literally a story. It means a narrative structure, some kind of setup, payoff sort of structure. User-generated styles are really good for mobile, for getting that genuine feeling, but you can't make up for good lighting and good sound. So production values still matter. You can mix that up. We're doing this with another client right now. We're doing a user-generated style of series of videos, but we're doing it in a user-generated style uh, with really good production values, with really good lighting, really good sound. So you can mix that up and kind of try to get that authenticity with a high production value. Um, and you can combine these elements to mix up and to increase your impact and your messaging. It, it really, it's so dependent on what the clients or what your ask is, what you're trying to accomplish with the video. The function will dictate the form, but this is a little bit of a discussion about the form. And this room doesn't need to hear it, but it bears saying repurposing content is everything. Just because you have a video doesn't mean you're doing anything with it. So feeding it into your social structure, feeding it into your social marketing, feeding it across multiple platforms, and one thing that I'm not seeing a lot of, but I think is really a, a wise idea, is breaking videos up into smaller chunks. And again, we're doing this right now with this other client. They asked us for a five-minute video, and we came back at them and said, well, how about five one-minute videos that all kind of connect to each other? That might be more effective. So now, when we're done with this other one, our client's going to have five beautiful little one-minute videos that they can sprinkle all throughout their social presence. And then you might even want to break it up further. Maybe there's a clip, maybe there's a bit from inside one of these videos that people are really responding to. Pull it out, clip it out, repurpose that out onto social, even boil it down to a GIF if necessary. People, I know people, uh, millennials particularly, who have told me literally, I won't click on a video, no one's got time for that. Most I'll click on is a GIF. <laughs> so, okay, make a little GIF out of it. Um, <laughs> and this leads to a truly silly bit. What is a one minute explainer video worth? What's it worth from a marketing and a messaging perspective? Well, we know the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, there's 30 frames per second in a normal video. At a thousand words, that brings us to 30,000 words. But if it's a one minute explainer video, that's times 60, so that brings us to 1.8 million words for a one minute explainer video. Now, do we think that's true? No. <laughs> but it's cute. Uh, and there is something to be said because, as we all know, different people have different learning styles, different styles of ingesting information. Uh, for a very visual person, a one-minute video might be worth 1.8 million words. It could be. Uh, it certainly is something that, as we're reaching out to people, as we're touching them through social media, as we're trying to draw them in with a more attractive style of marketing, it certainly bears being in mind especially for especially for topics like this one where it is a very complex topic that a lot of people are intimidated by and you want to give them an entree you want to give them an invitation that they will actually click on and a lot of people are not going to click on a Forbes article about financial planning because it's just too intimidating and they don't want to deal with it but when they see a stick figure being drawn on a thing that is somewhat of a universal response because we've all been through primary school it feels like all right I can handle this I can look at this and that's the way that you get them in then you end with linking them to more information and it's a very very effective tool for doing that yeah this campaign is, is still in progress I mean we don't know the exact final shape of it we know that the videos that we've been working on with them are going to be featured the exact how much is going to be on YouTube, how much is going to be on other social platforms, how much is going to be direct off of their domain. We don't know all those details just yet because it is in progress. But it's happening. It's definitely happening.